So I would like to introduce a very good friend of mine, Dr. Sean Anderson, who is currently Chair and Professor of Environmental Science and Resource Management at California State University, Channel Islands. Channel Islands is located halfway between Los Angeles and Santa Barbara, and it is on the mainland. It is not out on an island, although I'm sure- <laughs> We have research facilities on the I'm island. sure he's gonna talk about that. Sean received his Bachelor's of Science degree from UC Santa Barbara, his PhD from UCLA, and completed his postdoctoral fellowship at Paul Ehrlich Center for Cons Conservation Biology at Stanford University. Sean's research focuses on three major areas. Restoring degraded ecosystems, improving management of the coastal zone, and the scholarship of pedagogy. He has worked with students in Louisiana post-Hurricane Katrina to examine environmental impacts. They rebuilt homes, and currently they install community gardens. His coastal management work includes examining the effects of roads on animals, evaluating the sustainability of seafood options, and assessing the impacts of marine systems, the impacts of pollutants on marine systems. <laughs> Not marine systems on pollutants. No. That's good. That's good. Most recently, he has spearheaded the use of remotely piloted systems or drones underwater to improve the management of coastal systems. Sean serves on the Ventura County Conservation District, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy Advisory Committee, the California Sustainable Seafood Initiative Panel, and the Council on Ocean Affairs, Science and Technology. Please join me in welcoming Sean Anderson to see to UAS. Was it eight that I hit? Eight. Okay, is everybody going to go to sleep right now? Oh my God, is that going to happen right now? We have to point it through the back corner over here. Oh my God. Ah, oh, okay, good, great. Hey, thanks so much for the invite, you guys. I appreciate uh, uh, being able to come up here and, and spend some time with you guys. I should start my timer so I don't go on too long. Um, but uh, this is more of a thrown out ideas type of talk. Um, when I was younger, I had to always do research talks and, and talk about this specific thing and that specific thing. It's been great now that I'm an old dude that I can actually go to do these more fun talks where it's more of a sort of exploration of ideas and things. So by all means, please interrupt me if you guys have any questions, if I go too fast or something doesn't make sense. But my main point here is trying to, is to talk a little bit about um, what we do on my campus and just to throw out a bunch of examples. And hopefully some of those will be of interest to you guys. And maybe you might say, hey, we could pair up on that or maybe we could do something parallel or maybe we could try modifying something um, that we might be able to do a Channel Islands you know, Juno collaboration type thing, that would be really great, but, but that's the whole point of, of today. Oh, okay, the other thing I'm gonna say is, so my lab for years and years, uh, since I was at Stanford, I, I called it the Pacific Institute for Restoration Ecology, because I, I really am into uh, ecological restoration and stuff. And so the abbreviation for that was pirate, but I would never say that. So on grants and all kinds of things, I'd put that in. So um, I'm about to go on sabbatical next year, so it was six years or so ago um, when Karen was my dean, and I was I there was a controversy and can I riff on this? Is it, am I gonna be in trouble to riff on this? Okay, so uh, uh, so I was in uh, San Francisco getting ready to board the Rainbow Warrior Three because my dad painted all the other Rainbow Warriors for Greenpeace because my family is tight with those folks uh, and they're all crazy hippies and stuff. And so um, so uh, I was on the way to the boat and this the phone rang and I just. Uh, given some testimony and was quoted in the front page of the LA Times about this controversy in Los Angeles County. We're trying to restore the Los Angeles River and this was a, a controversy about a development proposal in the headwaters. And so I, I made some comments about how I didn't think that development was necessarily the right thing to do. But instead of saying Sean Anderson, professor from California State University, they said Sean Anderson, director of the Pacific Institute for Restoration Ecology. And another administrator who shall not be named got very angry and said, we have now have a policy on centers and institutes, and this is not an approved institute. And I said, what? You know, and so anyway, long story short, Karen, I had to get called up in front of Karen, and mom had to tell me, you can't use the word institute anymore. So we just shortened it to the pirate lab, and now everybody's like, well, you think you're pirates? Do you think you're like all oh, like rebels or something? And right around the same time, Right around the same time, we'd been experimenting with all these robots, but we do flying robots and swimming robots. 
And so we're trying to figure out a name for our group, which is not just me, it's other faculty members, other, other departments, very interdisciplinary. So we're trying to think of a name for the group. So my students decided to name it the Aerial and Aquatic Robotic Research Group. So it's the Pirate R group. <laughs> and so, uh, so that's why when I put up my logo, I have to cross out Institute, because mom talked to me that I'm not, long, not allowed to say that. But um, yeah, so, so my department is the longest named department on our campus, Environmental Science and Resource Management, extremely interdisciplinary. Our students spend the first two years basically out and about, taking a year, a year of biology, a year of economics, poli-sci, literature, all this stuff. And then they come back to us really for only the last two years. So we're a, a science degree, but we very much are, are grounded in the interdisciplinary nature of investigation and inquiry. Um, the challenge that we all face is, is there are many challenges, but um, we can talk about the sustainability of our planet and all the, the struggles that we are facing in terms of socioeconomics, in terms of ecosystem stresses. In the context of higher ed, we can also talk about more and more folks wanting to go to uh, our institutions, which is great, um, but more and more of those folks are coming to us and more and more of those folks are coming to us that are underprepared, which is a huge challenge. And then we have lots of bureaucracy and less funding and all that kind of stuff. This is, this is across the US and really across the planet. And so we have all these mounting challenges. We have more demand, but we have, in, in a very real sense, less capacity to, less to, the disposable funds to put towards these things. So the question is, is how are we gonna respond or how has higher ed generally responded to these stresses or these challenges? And so, uh, you know, this is the, the, the traditional old lecture hall thing. Um, and usually the response is, oh, you do something slightly different in your lecture. And you introduce some cool new fandangle thing and we'll innovate that way. Um, and while that can be appropriate, that isn't necessarily always appropriate. Um, a lot of times things are presented as a false dichotomy, I would argue, in terms of higher ed education. You have to do this or that. If you're not doing this, you suck. If you do this, you're great. Um, and then there's this oftentimes uh, siren call of the new thing, the, 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 the sparkly bobble that we should follow. Let's go follow that. And, and that, that, will, that will save us. That'll be cheaper to engage students. That'll be more effective to engage students, um, what have you. In higher ed, generally speaking, across the United States, not talking about your campus or my campus necessarily, but, but sort of the broader, broader swath, the new ways are always this is great. In this case, this is the re redoing of the California Academy of Sciences in, in San Francisco several years ago. And they re rebuilt the whole building and they're putting a green roof on there, which is great. Oftentimes, though, this is championed and the, the old ways, this old conservatory, for example, are, eh, that's not that's not so great. Typically, what, that, what they actually mean is not that the old ways are great, it's the old ways of other people are not great. My old ways are fine. And so there's this sort of tension that that uh, evolves. I have two quotes for unnamed people. I don't wanna get anybody in trouble or embarrass anybody, but these are real quotes that, that um, speak to some of this problem of this false dichotomy and stuff. So the first is from my, my graduate school, UCLA. I went to, my, my department originally was one department and then it was split into many departments. And so this is from the, the genesis of these, the split department. What it used to be one biology department and now there's a physiology thing and there's a that thing and a molecular this and a molecular that. So this is from a conversation between the faculty at the time. And so this one professor said, ecology is about as cutting edge as natural history, said with a lot of dripping disdain, as if natural history is some kind of horrible thing. The real biological science, and essentially everything worthy of our attention from here on out, is molecular. And that's why we need to split the department. And we need to put all the lame people in this department, and all the real scientists, all the real innovators need to be in these other departments. And so that, that was a very, um, caustic discussion and it, and it fractured and it, I would argue it harmed a lot of the science and a lot of the innovation at UCLA for at least in the life sciences for for decades. The next is when I went up to Stanford at first as a postdoc and this was my very first uh, uh, we had uh, retreats we had department retreats I never knew such a thing existed and we went and so one we went to do retreats two it was a private school so we could have beer which is great so I was drinking beer so I remember this exp explicitly at the time so I was leaning back drinking a beer and when this person said that, I coughed up my beer because I was so shocked. So, so what happened was the grad students had come up and they said, the faculty said, hey, what, how can we change this year? What can we help you with? 
And the grad students had this long list. Hey, we need to know about experimental design. We want to get out in the field more. We want to go you know, do, do field identification, all that kind of stuff. And then it got very quiet. And the, the professor that was speaking for the rest of the faculty, um, who's kind of a jerk, but that's another story, uh, says, um, we get that request, meaning to do all this out, outdoor stuff, field science, basically. We get that request a lot. And we uh, had discussed this. And we feel strongly that the real value that we have to offer you is theory. The rest you can simply learn from a book, and, which was ridiculous. And it explains why, for the subsequent years, I trained most of the ecologists at Stanford, because they could not get plant identification. They could not get any field experience in the other in the other labs, or most of the other labs. And so um, it, again, I would argue this, this has harmed the educational um, training and, and, uh, and perspectives of the students that go through that program, or at least went. In most higher ed institutions in, in the US, we, have, we typically see things like this geological survey vessel. Specialization is rewarded. And integration is, generally speaking, undervalued, I would, I would argue. And so we could talk about specialization or integration, or we could use terms that are maybe more familiar to the professors, which is research and teaching. So research is typically rewarded with more lab space and more resources and things like that. And teaching is like, you know, not that people are anti-teaching, of course, but that's not, you know, that doesn't really move the train for most of our campuses. And so um, you guys have a different approach to that. We have a different approach. So I'm going to spend the rest of the talk just talking about some examples run through a bunch of things um, that, that how we have done or different projects that we have done that um, are, are trying to do things hopefully somewhat differently and more, more integrative uh, in terms of our approach. The traditional tool, there's a bunch of tools we'll talk about and a bunch of different approaches, but at the core I would say um, of the, the good stuff from the past that we should hold on to tightly is curiosity and exploration and the ability to engage audiences. The ability to, to have conversations with folks, to bring folks into our, our sphere and have, have all kinds of wonderful collaborations, et cetera. Um, we have new capabilities that we really value at our campus, and I think you guys probably value that too. One is technology. I sometimes poo-poo technology a lot, but we use tons of the technology. Um, the second is diversity. So diversity is really a true strength, as you guys know that are in the the outdoor program and all this and that, when you have different perspectives, because we're getting new problems all the time. When you guys are doing your trek across the ice field or when you're trying to invent some new thing or whatever it is, um, having different perspectives to check you to, to offer alternatives, very, very useful and, and invaluable in, in many cases. Diversity in the broadest sense, diversity in terms of life experience, diversity in terms of economic background, all that stuff. Um, and then another relatively new capability is this notion of really engaging with our local communities or the local communities where we're working. And, and that's a really uh, powerful approach. So a couple quick examples before we get on to the specific ones. So that's my dad. So my, my dad's a, a oil painter, professional oil painter. And um, he's here ex uh, checking out in 1981 in this beach in Northern California, this pregnant dead uh, giant, giant blue whale, female. Um, and, and he's checking her out because he wanted to paint her, he wanted to paint whales better. And so when I was growing up, this notion was always, always, you know, continuously be curious, always ask questions. What's going on with this? And so that was baked into me. One, the other thing is I have a bunch of different family members from Hawaii and from all over the place um, that talked a lot. As Karen will tell you, I talk a lot. And so this notion of talking a lot has really um, been quite valuable in terms of starting new conversations with people. So, so being curious and being able to engage folks in story um, has been really helpful. Old tools are also really valuable. This is a, a, one of my former students who's now a, a professor in, in um, the San Francisco Bay Area sent me this photo. This is us down, this is my PhD project where we made giant, essentially trampolines underwater off, off one of the Channel Islands in Southern California. And so this old school stuff of using quadrats, PVC, rebar, that kind of stuff, that's, a, that's alive and well. We use a lot of old tools in addition to our new fancy technology. Uh, this is my PhD, one of my sort of co-advisors, my PhD advisor, the guy on the right, 
And those are some of my uh, students, all of which are now, the guy on the left is working for uh, a county agency, getting ready to start a graduate program. The guy uh, next to him is in uh, work for a drone company, a new startup drone company that's doing all the surveying of the largest utility in California. The guy next to him, um, I'm not sure where Andrew is right now, but he used to work in Hawaii um, Volcano National Park. And, and so my professor was awesome. I, I was really blessed to have a, a fantastic advisor, um, but he couldn't deal with some of the challenges that we have that requires new skills. So he was, he was great at what he did. He was great in his time, a fantastic natural historian. Um, but, but we really do need to bring some new approaches, I would argue, to engagement to solve some of these problems and to, and to really um, help move our students forward. In our program, so we usually abbreviate it ESRM, shorthand for Environmental Science and Resource Management. Um, you know, for all these things, faculty going through tenure, justifying budgets, all that kind of stuff, we typically have to put our, our activities into a bin. It's usually either a teaching bin, a research bin, or a service bin. And that's incredibly hard for us. So we really, as I hope to show you over the next few minutes, we, these things are not distinguishable for us. So that our teaching and research and scholarship, it all morphs and, and reinforces one another. So it's very, very difficult for us to draw hard lines between this activity and that activity. Um, so the first example I'll talk about is the Thomas fire. So this was this fire that happened in our county in, in Southern California uh, at the start of December last year. Um, and for the, for the, at the time was the largest wildfire ever in state history, recorded state history. That goes back to the uh, late 1860s. Um, and uh, now it's only the second largest because we had this big complex, Mendocino complex fire this summer. I'm sure by next summer we'll just be the third largest. This, this notion of changing environments is, is changing so rapidly that the, the, the records get broken all the time. But this is a crazy fire. It was incredibly complete burn. Um, uh, horizontal flames for much of it. Flames going 30, 40, 50, 60 miles an hour for, for hours and days on end. It was, it was amazing how fast this fire progressed. Starting inland and then blew towards the coast in uh, what we call a Santa Ana condition. Um, but as an example, so this fire started and I was actually at my son's water polo award ceremony thing so I didn't even catch it when it first started. I went home and then started getting these texts that this is going on. So this, this was an, an incredibly fast moving fire. So very quickly, we took some of our teaching tools. Uh, so we have a strong push for digital identity for our students. So all of my students create their own blogs, their own websites, and they have to manage their own account rather than having Facebook or Twitter or whoever do it. They do it themselves and they control the message. And then that's usually used as a resume when they go apply for jobs. So we actually turn it on its head and we decided instead of using this tool to make student blogs or, or, or class blogs, we actually made a community resource. And so we made this thing, community fire tracker, godaddy.com, allowed us to host it for free for basically about two months. And we created a real time data feed for the public. And so we pulled in all, we integrated all this data that was coming in about fire behavior and resources for folks who were displaced, et cetera. And that's me at a coffee shop talking to all these guys uh, around, actually around the country who were helping us stand up this website. And over the course of about 24 hours, we had a new, web, a new resource for the community. So something that was, that was a teaching tool that in the time of crisis, we turned as a community uh, uh, value, a community resource. Um, we, done, we do a fair amount of work on wildlife mortality. And so very quickly, we started collecting data. People started sending me data on critters that were killed. So on the left, that's a, a juvenile mountain lion that was burned up. And this over here is a, a juvenile black bear that um, had to be euthanized, that was, that was burnt in the fire. So we started tracking that. So we had some real-time data. And then I real, we realized because of the restriction in these natural disasters, we can't always get to where we want to go to um, because of roads being closed for fire access, et cetera. We stood up a, a Survey123. Has anybody used Survey123? It's an ArcGIS product. Anyway, it's a, it's a little tool that you can do surveying for the public. And so we started having the public report in, and we started getting reports crowdsourced essentially where the kills were happening. So we could measure um, how many critters were dying and, and who was dying and where and all that kind of stuff uh, almost in real time. So uh, fantastic. This is all as the students are all evacuated and as every, the campus is evacuated and everything's all crazy and, and chaotic. 
Um, we're also able to do some estimates from some of our imagery and some of our ex previous uh, background um, to look at the vegetative communities and look at what was burned. And so our quick back of the envelope calculation is so far the only calculation that's officially been published. But what we're looking at is we're looking at this area where the fire was. The red is, is the, fire, the, the ultimate fire perimeter boundary. And so we estimated that um, we pumped out about 3.6 million tons of CO2 in the atmosphere from this one fire. You have no idea what that means. It's some big giant number that I don't know what it means. To put it in context, when we do carbon emission inventory, it takes a long time. It's a, it's a large accounting thing. So it takes about a year or two to get the numbers solidified. So the most recent numbers we have are the 2015 carbon emissions from across the state of California. And what this one fire did over this, this, few, this you know, short few weeks here, we emitted all the carbon that was emitted in 2015 from all the shipping and commercial uh, boat activity for the whole state, or 10% of all the agricultural emissions from across the state. So that's a huge amount of carbon from this one event. Um, and so uh, I was invited to give a talk about the Thomas Fire. It, so the Thomas Fire started in, in on December 4, and I was invited to give a talk in early January because nobody knew much and, and the fire was still going. And so I gave a talk, and in there, I started talking about what we knew and what I was wondering about. So one of the things that we did, let's see. So we started flying the, the burn, and this is some of our drone footage. This is a, a dam that we're trying to take down uh, behind the city of Ventura. It's called Matillaha Dam. And so we were the first ones in there to map what was going on. And so um, we're able to use this footage to get estimates of erosion and how much sediment might be going in and, and further impacting the reservoir, et cetera. And also just to help um, county agencies and public agencies understand the magnitude of the burn when they couldn't physically get in. And so this is from one of our uh, flying robots or flying drones. We also offered our services to whoever um, needed help. So one of my students are very prof proficient in terms of using this equipment and flying it. They also have all the FAA permits, the legal permits to allow them to do this. And so one of the first calls we got was from the Santa, was from the Ventura, um, Santa Buena Ventura um, City Hall and, and the Botanical Gardens, which is just behind City Hall, that had completely burned up. They said, we need some help. So we're, what you're looking, and so this is where, you guys might not know, but so the mission system started in, in Baja, California and spread up Winifred Serra in the 1700s and helped establish um, the Spanish influence in California. So one of these missions is called San Buenaventura. That's too long, so we don't use that name. We just call it Ventura is the shorthand term. And right behind the city hall was, or right next to the city hall is a mission. And so in this botanical gardens, the fire revealed, burned off all this vegetation, some of which was 150 years old, and had covered all these, these archeological resources that nobody had seen in at least 100, 100 years or so. So what you're looking at is a, is a non-masonary wall that was put in to essentially um, uh, do plantings, do terracing in the hillside. So um, all this awesome archaeology was suddenly revealed, and there was huge fears that when it would rain, we get massive erosion, and it would, wa it would wash away, or we it would bury it in mud. So we told, took our drones out, flew it, and mapped stuff down to a centimeter resolution so that um, if we did, it turned out we didn't get massive flooding, but if we got massive flooding the rest of the year, the archaeologists could come back and know exactly where to dig for these resources. So telling a really interesting human side of the story with our environmental sensing tools. Um, and then in that talk, I, I, I talked about what you're looking at is an oil seep on fire. So, so Ventura is, an, is the, the home for um, a lot of the early oil exploration um, in the US. And in fact, our first offshore oil wells were in um, Santa Barbara and Ventura. The folks in Louisiana, our friends in Louisiana say they invented it. They're mostly full of it. They're not, they're not telling you the truth. Um, and, and the oil and gas production went to Ventura because of all this natural seepage of asphaltines, of the, this tar near the surface. And so when the fire came through, it set a bunch of this tar on fire. And what we're looking at is a fire, a subterranean fire, next to this major roadway. So these we put out, but a lot of the fires were not put out. They're too far, too hard to get to. All the vegetation had burned, so there was no real fire risk. And so I mapped this, and I put this map up in my presentation and said, here are all the known oil seeps um, and wellheads. Again, that's the, that's the footprint of the fire. And I said, so I think a lot of these might be on fire. And one of our partners 
in the, uh, one of our, who became one of our partners, one of these NGOs in the community said, hey, we're interested in that. So they wrote a grant to the state of California and asked us to be a partner. And now we have a new grant coming in that is being incorporated into classwork as well as student projects to go out and fly a bunch of drones to actually census these things. So is that service or is that research or is that teaching? Is that student training? It's sort of all of it wrapped up into one. And so these, these efforts that we do completely cross fertilize and reinforce um, all these other uh, efforts. So a, a few themes here that, that seem to constantly pop up in our teaching and our, in our work um, is uh, we embed applied research in most of our classes. So we have activities that students collect this data as part of a routine undergraduate class, monitoring, assessing, public opinion polling, et cetera. We have a strong focus on service learning. So, so we could do a project on anything to, to illustrate this concept, or we could do a project that uh, works with the homeless shelter and, and talks about the value of, this, of the same concept in a more applied context, and we choose the latter. Um, we really do s seek diverse perspectives. So in my class, oil companies speak, as well as sort of anti-oil activist group and, and, and government regulators, all those folks come to the table um, and they really appreciate being invited. So most campuses don't invite folks, they seem to take one tact or the other. We use tech when we can, we have a strong focus on writing and quanti so all my students write and they're like, oh my God, they have to write. And then as they graduate, like Dr. Ray, you should make them write more, right? That's what they always say. So we do a lot of writing, a lot of quantitative skills, graphing, statistics, all that good stuff. We have a strong focus on interdisciplinarity so both in our department and across our department and with all our collaborations. We really do believe we're, we're an access institution. So basically, it's, it, we take pretty much whoever comes to us, but we still have a, a high standard. So we expect those folks to be able to write, even though they come into our program not having those skills, we expect them to graduate with these skills. We embrace failure. I don't like to fail, but it's part of what we do. And so we really have a, we try to destigmatize failing and okay, that sucks, get, it, get over it, and let's go try it again, and let's try it again, and let's try it again. And for many of our students who um, come from backgrounds that there aren't people that look like them that are doing the kind of projects that we're doing, or, or they've been told in school, you're not very smart, you can't do that, um, it really is important to allow them to fail and support them when they fail and keep reinforcing them as they go on. And then lastly, uh, I would say we're poor, but that doesn't sound right. So we say we're scrappy because that's much better, that we, we do a lot with very little funding. We're very efficient. And so the next year, I'm just going to ramble on. I've been rambling on for a bit. But I'm just going to run through different examples. And if, we, if you guys want to ask questions, great. If not, I'll just, I'll just keep talking. So um, I'll say that, that our program, our, our campus, but especially my program, is global in scope. So these are all places where we have uh, research projects going on, or at least very recently ended research projects. These are only my sites. So if we add in all my colleagues, we go all over the place. And even though we're a small little new school, um, we do ex try to expose students to as much international perspective, as many international perspectives and challenges as possible. And wherever we can, we take students with us. The one exception is Eastern Turkey. It's a little crazy. I can't take students there. Um, but uh, for example, this is some of our work there. I was talk we were talking at the reception about some of our work on bears and wolves and things. So this is uh, my colleague Yosef Kusak from Univers University of Zagreb. Um, and he's a world expert on carnivores. So we've just trapped that gray wolf. She stepped in a trap, but it's a rubber trap, so she's not gonna be hurt. And she's gotten snagged. And so we're not allowed, it's near the border and there's all these things where they arrest us and stuff at times. And so. Um, uh, we're not allowed to have guns, so that's not a gun, that's a medical de instrument delivery device, um, is what we refer to it as. And so he's just darted her in the butt, and she's about to fall asleep, and then we'll go and, and take some blood and, and check her condition and measure her, and then put a GPS collar on her, then give her the, the, the counteractive agent, and she'll wake up and run into the forest. And then we get, and then after about a year or so, the collar falls off of her. So we're able to take that data, map the territories of these predators, and actually propose new national park boundaries to the uh, government when the government listens to us, but that's another story. Um, so again, the value stuff. So this is the, the then mayor of the province where we're working in Kars, and then the mayor of the city of Kars, and we're at this place where we've opened up a new um, ecotourism place.
because I would leave during the middle of the semester because of the timing of, of bird migrations, we started doing, I started doing podcasting. And so from that, which was created not because I wanted to podcast, but just because I kind of had to, it since led to us opening all kinds of other online tools that have been really valuable to a whole host of programs. And so we used to use iTunes. Students don't like iTunes anymore. So now we primarily use YouTube to uh, screencast lectures and, and things of that nature. Even when things are far away, we try to bring it into our classrooms. So this is last year. This is as um, the hurricanes were hitting Florida and we're, we're, we're um, Skyping into the mayor of Miami. And so we're talking to him as the storm just passed through. This is my coastal marine management class. The students are asking questions. How are you managing this challenge? What's, what's the biggest problem here? So as much as possible, we try to pull this stuff into our classroom. Funding does matter. I have to say that. It, it, it would be great if it didn't, but it does. And so this was our old lab. Still, this is still our lab space, but this was our, our, when we were all crammed into this and people were on top of each other building things. Um, this is our brand new build. I call it brand new. It's three years now, but our brand new building, which is if you guys came in early and I, you guys were looking at that video, the, the video, the 360 videos of, of some of this. So this has been transformative. So having a new facility has allowed us to grow and be able to engage a lot more students. Um, so that's like big capital expenditures. That's, you know, millions of dollars for a new building. That's important, but that's hard to get. Also really, really successful um, and really key to our program has been this stuff. So we're a small little university. We can't compete, generally speaking, with the big R1s and the big, big guns and stuff. Um, but where we can compete is with our teaching proficiency. And so, so we can go after those educational grants, and that's usually our first crowbar under the window. So we go and get some money to do some education thing. That allows us to get the instrument or the, the device, whatever it is. And then from there, we start collecting data, and then we become competitive for those, those other grants. So in this case, this is a NOAA education grant. This was a product called OpenROV that we became really proficient at and started helping people around the planet with their devices. Now we just this summer got the next generation of this, so my students right now are actually playing with that. So the educational grants, we can be really competitive, and that's oftentimes the first step to getting uh, more significant funding. I would say that we're cheaper. We're not cheap, but we're cheaper. This is a, a project one of my students comparing traditional survey methods with new um, LIDAR and, and drone-based methods. We do a lot of DIY tech, so we make a lot of the stuff ourselves with open source things and makerspace type, type uh, approaches um, that uh, are really cost effective. Um, because of the, these approaches that I'd mentioned that were very applied and, and all these things, it turns out we're very nimble and I would say we're very improvisational. So I like jazz, so we're like a jazz lab, we're like a pirate jazz lab or something. But all these instruments basically give us flexibility. So this, this fixed wing thing, which is basically equivalent in functionality to our, we have an MOU with NOAA, so we partner with them to do drone-based stuff. Their essentially equivalent device costs about $200,000. This, this fixed wing we built for um, just about $1,500. So it doesn't, it can't quite do every single thing they can do, but it does about 95% of what their device does. And if ours crashes, oh well, we're at a thousand bucks as opposed to hundreds of thousands of bucks. Um, so all these tools give us flexibility and allow us to respond. So for example, when we had the largest oil spill since the 1969 oil spill in Santa Barbara in 2015, we were the first team on site. So we um, could take our underwater robots and drive them underwater and actually look to see if we had subsurface deposition. Um, fantastic. Um, we can also use these devices in, in maybe non-traditional ways. So this is some of our work in Louisiana where we're looking at the efficacy of our bottomland hardwood forest restoration. And we do a lot of the estimate, estimations of tree height from the ground, and we're doing it very quickly. And so this, this last uh, spring, we took our drone and flew it up and started cross-checking ourselves. So we'd fly to the top of the trees and then use the altimeter in the drone to see, how, see what the actual height of the tree was and compare our estimate. So not sophisticated at all. You can do this with a $300 drone. You don't need some magical training or whatever. Um, and it turns out that we were um, actually pretty good. So this is our, our, the drone's estimate of the height of the tree. And then on the, on the bottom scale, on, the, on the, the Y axis is our human estimates. And most of us are really good. It turns out one guy was bad. That was the director of the UCLA Herbarium. I won't say his name, Tom Huggins, but um, he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't, he was the worst estimator of height but right, I mean, awesome stuff. This is publishable data. This is data that can directly help our NGO partners and state folks um, with just a little teeny bit of tech to confirm this stuff. 
So you don't need to do, you know, you don't need to climb mountains initially. You can just do some of the core basic um, functionality. We do a lot of quantifying threats. And so this is at Karen's house right now. Oh my God, it's so exciting. I brought it to you guys. So um, we've done a lot of work with uh, microplastics and are doing more and more. And we've, uh, I can tell you more later if you want, but suffice it to say, microplastics are everywhere. Every single beach that we've looked at around the planet, we've found microplastics. Every single population of marine invertebrates that live on or near the beach, we've found microplastics in their guts. And it goes on and on and on. Um, a few, uh, about two years ago, we were doing some work in our lab and we started getting some of these fibers and I said, oh my God, is there other fibers in this building? Surprise, surprise, our brand new building with fancy HEPA filters and all this kind of stuff was, was shedding microplastics. So we went outside to see what was going on and um, we're finding microplastics in the air and then just last year we started finding microplastics in rainwater. So these rain collectors out at Karen's house um, we said, what the hell's going on in Alaska? Let's go check out Alaska. A perfect thing. You guys can do this no problemo. It's very, very cheap. Um, and so just from our stuff that we pulled in from Santa Rosa Island last weekend, that's what you're looking at. And so what you're, what you're looking at is underneath the microscope. You're seeing a microfiber there on the bottom. So that's a little piece of plastic, a little fibrous piece that comes from our underwear or clothing, that kind of stuff. But all those beads are pieces of plastic that are in the air that are being rained out. We've now found microbeads rained out of the air. So microbeads from cosmetics. So this microplastics is an absolute marker of the Anthropocene and is something that no one has a handle on. A perfect way to engage undergrads in a class, go out and do this lab activity. There is no manual because nobody's figured out how to do this, but it's a very simple procedure. And by turning students on to that kind of stuff, they get super jazzed. They pay more attention. Their test scores go up. They're more engaged and, and all, all, the, all the things get better um, when you do these types of things. We work on endangered plants because we have a lot of endangered plants. So this is a, this is a restoration experiment transplanting some uh, lichen to see if we can recover an endangered Dudleya species. Again, this is, I should say this is all done with undergrads. So undergrads are all of our um, uh, labor force as well as a lot of the drivers of this research in addition to being used in our classes. A lot of times our students start the projects out, great idea, and then we fold it into a subsequent class the next year. Um, so here's a quick version. Uh, is this okay? I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm going too fast. Is this, is this okay for you guys? Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, here's another example. Again, this is a student-driven project. So this is, we have a lot of beaches in our county. 97% of our coastline is Sandy Beach. Um, and we spend a lot of time quantifying the, the social value of beaches as well as the geomorphology and erosion and all that kind of good stuff. One of the things we have is our, our beach nesting shorebirds. And so these are our models of beach nesting shorebirds, the little teeny chicks. They blend in really, really well to tan. They're hard to see and they're endangered. And there's fewer and fewer of them all the time. Our part of the world is one of the last epicenters of, of a high number of these guys. This is what that beach looks like. Um, uh, looks very fragmented and totally developed to you guys. It's one of the largest remaining minimally disturbed sandy beaches in Southern California. It says it actually has a dune complex, goes back to a wetland. We have a power plant right there. That's another story. On the left is the stuff that you guys can get. If you go online and try to get satellite imagery, that's the resolution you get. When we fly our, our, our robots over the ground, this is the resolution we get. Much, much better. Um, we, we fly our robots in a lawnmower pattern, and so that's what the, the blue thing is illustrating. And we get things like this. This is software that our students have become very proficient with, and now actually this company now hires They've hired three of my students so far in the last two years to go work for them and they make, you know, six figure salaries and make more money than we do. And, you know, I guess that's good. I guess that's good. Um, but uh, what we're looking at, it looks like a picture of a dune that's actually a point cloud. So it's actually not a visualized thing. Later on, we'll overlay the photos and get much more high resolution stuff. But we can do all kinds of great stuff. We can get uh, NDVI, which is a measure of greenness, how many plants are there. We can look at topographic complexity, all from a simple flight from a three, well, we have more fancy units, but you can do this with a $300 drone. You don't need a gazillion million dollar thing to do this. And what we're doing is we're pairing this with infrared imagery and looking at, at the nests. Um, and so we've actually can document that these guys are nesting inside tire tracks. These guys are nesting inside human footprints. So these birds are really choosing any little teeny little nook and cranny to hide in. Now the problem is, of course, we can go out and observe this ourselves. When we walk out, we attract corvids. We attract crows and ravens, and they kill the babies. 
We started to get smart. We tried to put popsicle sticks to mark the, 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 the nest so we can see them and then back off. The birds figured out what the popsicle sticks meant and they went and killed the chicks and ate the eggs. So having this ability to remotely sense these, these chicks and detect if they're there and healthy, much, much minimization, lots of minimization of our impact and hopefully better for the, the critters as well. And our students are the ones that are piloting all this and doing all of this uh, stuff. We also have a strong focus on collaboration. So a few examples here. This is, one of, this is our class to the Cook Islands. Um, and uh, the guy on the lower left over there was, a, was then a master's student at Plymouth um, Marine Lab in the UK, which is kind of like Scripps or Woods Hole here in the US. And they were looking at fluorescing proteins. They were biomedical folks. They were interested. They're developing a new cancer screening technique. They want to give you a, a little drug that you, you drink, and then they want to shine light on you to see if you have cancer rather than using radiation. So it's a, it's a crazy thing. And it turns out a lot of the fluorescent proteins that they're looking for were in coral. And, they said, and we said, hey, we're going there. So we talked, we, and, and they, had, they had an ROV like we did that was broken, so we helped them fix it. And they said, we, oh, we're right like you guys, right? You're cool. And so they said, do you have any coral in Channel Islands? I said, yeah, we have coral, but not the sexy kind that you really want. We have just some sort of ugly, boring coral. And they said, all oh, right. And so I said, hey, but we're going to the Cook Islands. You guys want to join us? Like, no, but we'll send our student. And so, so they built a, a light emitter, and we built a receptor on our, on our robot, and then we flew across the Pacific. I'm like, Oh my God, I hope they work. Oh my God, I hope they work. Oh my God, I hope they work. And it turned out they worked. And it was fantastic. So what you're looking at on the left is fluorescing coral. You're looking at uh, fluorescing tridactic clams. We think we can now detect a disease outbreak in coral. All of this from student projects. Very, very cool. And there's all kinds of other neat things that are happening with that. But, um, but an example of collaboration across the Pacific. Um, we have a strong focus on deliverables for the public. So this is another project from the Cook Islands that's now, I guess Esri is using this as one of their major things when they do advertising for, uh, for their GIS product. And so this is our measure of reef health. This is the Aitutaki in the Cook Islands. And this is, these are surveys we've done all around, including surveys of people, surveys of algae, surveys of fish. And so a visualization of which reefs are healthy, which are not. Um, we have our annual class in Louisiana that some of us have talked about. So we started going there in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. We spent about half our time doing wetland restoration, half doing, as Karen mentioned, doing originally home rebuilding. Now we install food gardens, but um, uh, fantastic collaborations. So it's our universe. So it began with us, but now it includes uh, Oregon State, UCLA. We've had folks from UC Santa Cruz, from local universities in Louisiana join us. And it's a fantastic, um, very, very um, uh, uh, embedding in the culture type of class where we do all that, then we meet with Pulitzer Prize winners at night, we do the history of Louisiana with chefs, talking about all the different cultural influences on food, students learn how to cook food um, in Louisiana style, we do meet with jazz musicians and all that kind of good stuff, all with the goal of trying to figure out what is this community about, how can, what went wrong in terms of Hurricane Katrina, Deepwater Horizon, and how is the recovery gone? Um, we already talked about that. That's, that's our survey tool. Um, we embrace failure. So here's a crash drone. That sucks, right? Because we don't have much money and everything. But um, it's OK as long as we learn from it, right? So, so as long as it crashes, do a blog post about that. Talk to other students about how we can avoid this. Um, and, and, we, and, and when we fail, I get angry for about 30 seconds, and then we go on, right? And so we teach the students the same thing. So we do a lot of 3D printing which is fantastic. We print a lot in plastic, as much as we hate plastic. We print a lot in plastic because we work so close to the marine zone. Uh, ABS and PVC and these things hold up way better. So for thrusters, for gimbals, all that kind of stuff. And so my students do all this. I don't even know how to work these things now. And I should say, so this printer, wait, which one's this? This is our biggest printer. This is like $3,000, right? This isn't a million dollars. This isn't $5 million. This isn't some crazy CNC machine. Um, and so, so printing this, in this case, is a thruster housing that's like, I don't know, half a penny or so worth of plastic. So the students do it, and they screw it up, and they have to do it again, and they screw that up, and they do it again, they screw that. And after the 30th time, all of a sudden, he or she is an expert printer, and it's great. And so, and so they go on. And so um, they become so fast at prototyping. Um, so this is my story. So we were, we're making a, a GoPro mount for one of our ROV survey devices to go count some fish. And uh, my student came in and talked to me. This was several years ago now. And uh, you know, so it was late in the day. My student said, hey, can you stop by? We have some questions about these, these bones. We had in an owl pellet, and they needed some help. So I'm helping them. 
And the student came up and showed me this thing. He goes, what do you think about this? And I said, no, it's too thin. The, the tines are too small, and I'm afraid we don't have enough money to replace another GoPro. So if this breaks off, it's not going to work. So I said, make, make the, the holder thicker. Make it a few millimeters thicker. And he said, OK, and he disappeared. So then the students, the other students are asking me questions about barn owl pellets. So I'm at, this is a mouse, and like da, 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 da. And my phone's ringing, it's my wife. I'm like, where the hell, you're not home? What's up, because dinner's cold. Why aren't you home? I'm like, sorry, 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 you know, and everything, and I'm, I'm a horrible guy. And, and so I start to leave, and as I'm leaving, the student walks back in, this is like 15 minutes later, walks back in with this yellow thing. Is what about this? Or sorry, he started with the yellow one, he walked in with the green one. I said, dude, I said, make it bigger, man. Make it several minutes, he said, I did. So over the course of the 15 minutes, he'd gone in, changed his, this all open source stuff, so you don't need to pay for anything. So he changed the size, the dimensions, and he had printed that thing in 15 minutes. And so that's the speed at which we can operate when, when needed, right? And so, and again, it's all students. It would take me three days to do that. It takes them about three minutes. Um, and this allows us to do all kinds of things. When we have students that can't scuba dive for various health reasons, whatever, they can use the ROV. So it imp 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 uh, improves accessibility. So they can now count, in this case, the number of fish inside a protected area, the number of fish outside a protected area using this technology. It also, these, are, these, these technological approaches and, the, and these embed, this embedding research and service learning in classes also give us new perspectives. So what you're looking at is uh, five days ago um, on one of our local beaches, and this guy had put his surfboard down and we get a lot, we get this a lot, people, we're talking about this at lunch, about, oh, coastal erosion. Yeah, well, you know, in 10 years, it's going to change. So he put his surfboard down, went over, and that cliff caved down on his surfboard. So if you look at it a little closer, that's his surfboard buried underneath this eroding coastal, coastal stuff. And so the guy was a little PO'd, shall we say. Um, and so we weren't going out to document this. We were going out to document our students were measuring the slope of the beach, but we get all this cool extra stuff. And so, so other ways to engage with the public. Um, in terms of our work in Hawaii, this is my colleague Rachel Cartwright. Um, so we started, they used to do behavioral observation of whales from boats. So this is again a class that we take to Hawaii. So the students are the ones collecting the data. Um, and it was in, we're looking at mother-calf relationships in the Maui Channel. Um, and so it turns out it's way better to do it with drones. So they don't, re they don't react to, to drones, they just think they're a seagull or whatever. We can do morphometrics and we can tell condition factor of the females from this data way better than we could when do, by doing observations from the boat. Um, and, and all kinds of great uh, insights are coming from this. Um, again, this is uh, an example video. So this is a three-dimensional map that we made from drone footage. So this is only about a, a $300 drone. This is one of the first ones, this is old. But so um, we're gonna zoom in that. Now our, our, our images are much more accurate now. So we're, we're flipping this model in 3D space and you can zoom in and count nests and do all kinds of really cool stuff. All kinds of geomorphological change detection. We're now using LIDAR that we built. Um, so our LIDAR, uh, that we're, the, our LIDAR drone that we built is $13,000. To do a small flight, for us, at least in California, it's $30,000 to do one flight from an airplane to get one data grab. So this one device is one third the cost and our device can fly right before a storm, right after a storm. Hope it doesn't crash, if it crashes, oh well, you know, we're down $13,000. Whereas if the plane crashes, the pilot's injured, you're spilling fuel, all that kind of stuff. So not only can we use the, the LIDAR to do geomorphology, we can also do biomass assessments of trees and things of that nature. Um, uh, we actually use this to document um, dumping after the Thomas fire, um, but a lot of our stuff isn't, isn't necessarily the, the high techy stuff. We do a lot of the low stuff, low tech stuff as well. This is my conservation biology class and the students are working on designing a marine protected area. It turns out when I told them I wanted them to role play, they wouldn't role play, lame students, right? Um, and so I figured out if I give them hats and said, you have to act like the fishermen, you have to act like the enviro, you have to act like the mayor. Suddenly with the hats, then they started acting like the mayor and like the oil company folks or whatever. So, so a low-tech solution that actually leads to more real-world engagement and, real more, and much more valuable interactions and, and learning opportunities. Um, we do um, a lot in the field, but we also take our students to a lot of different industry and, and um, different locations. In this case, this is the largest seafood um, supplier in Southern California. So we take students there and they, they learn about seafood sustainability and stuff from, from those guys that source their seafood from around the planet. Do a, lot of, do a lot of field surveys with all these classes, be it in the intertidal, 
Um, other places, students do data collections in businesses as well as out in, the, out in the public. And this stuff allows us to have new conversations. So we get invited to new places, um, but we also get to be invited to places. So this is the DARPA Robotics Challenge that maybe is sort of a natural fit. But this is um, a sculpture that our students built with marine debris from one of our projects. So this is, this is water bottles lit up with LED lights and is exhibited at the Getty Museum. So you guys might not know about the Getty, but it's one of our, our large art museums in Southern California. So we're exhibiting this artwork talking about marine plastics and everything from a, a, a sculpture created by art students in, in science, in our ESRM students. So super, super cool. So helping have those conversations in museums as well as in uh, more traditional science venues. We build devices for NGOs. So in this case, this is uh, in East Africa. So we've built some ROVs for those folks and are helping them with their educational plans. So even though we don't go to Africa, we're their sort of technical expert when stuff breaks, we can help them repair stuff. Um, and, and it sounds like I'm talking a lot about the sciencey stuff. We do a lot of the social dimension stuff as well. And so in this case, this is, uh, where is this? I just talk you. And we're at this beautiful, awesome beach, tropical beach. Oh, it looks so great. And what do you hear? Some, some uh, it's a technical term, jackass, from New Zealand is flying his drone and, and super loud. And not only is he flying his drone and disturbing everybody that's trying to recreate and all this and that, he's also right in front of the, the landing zone for the airport. So the airport is just to the left. So he's flying this device. And I said, oh, dude, what are you doing? Oh, I just got this thing for Christmas. You know, I'm just flying it. I'm like, well, maybe you shouldn't be that high. Yeah, no, it's fine, it's fine. So we're really interested in the perception of we scientists and our technology as well. So we've been doing a, a, a coastal public opinion polling for a long time. So we typically survey between 1,000 and 1,500 people every fall um, in Southern California. We also do a drone poll that's a national poll. But the idea there is this is created as a teaching tool so that when we talk about energy, Etc. And it, instead of me telling them what the public feel, uh, thinks about, the students can actually pull in and they say, oh, these guys actually think offshore drilling is a good thing or is a bad thing or what have you. One of the questions we asked uh, starting a few years ago, this is just from one year, this is one snapshot from 2014. We said, what do you think about if you went out and about and you saw one of these drones flying up in the air, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And so people said, they can say it's either very bad, bad, neutral, good, or very good. So if you look at the bottom, I've summarized the responses. So the negative responses and the positive. And that's usually what we hear about in the newspaper, and the media. So negative, about two, roughly two to one for the negative stuff. So this is bad, this sucks, we shouldn't have it. That's all baloney for the most part. The real story is the neutral and the unsure. If you had the people that haven't made up their mind or don't know if it's a bad thing or a good thing, if you had those guys together, you're getting about two thirds of the population. That's really, the, those are the folks we need to have the conversations with. Those are the folks that haven't decided if this is a useful technology, if this is a detrimental technology. And so these, these, this polling effort really helps illuminate um, people's attitudes, but also where the points that we can best engage with are. Um, and we do all kinds of stuff with other things, and I'm, I'm probably running out of time here, but, but um, um, really, really valuable data that we then sh uh, shunt over to our, our management agencies, et cetera. In this case, everybody thinks pollution is the worst thing ever. People don't think invasive species are that bad. They don't think habitat fragmentation is bad, over-harvesting. Everybody, and this is since the 70s, pollution is the biggest environmental challenge. And so to be sure pollution is a major challenge, I don't know if most of us would say pollution is the worst thing in the world. Uh, habitat fragmentation, habitat destruction, conversion of landscapes, things like that are probably more problematic. And I'll just finish up with a, a few examples of some of our immersive learning stuff. So this is a buzzword. So you, you guys that were here early, I, I showed you guys those videos of some of the 360 videos that we're talking about. That'd be a great way, easy step for us to start to collaborate. You guys could do some 360 videos up here on the glacier. We could do some 360 videos down south and, and an easy way to sort of transport people to, to sites that they can't travel to or it's too expensive to travel to. And so we've been doing this since the 1700s. So these sort of virtual reality things have been around for a long time, but increasing, obviously right now, things have gotten much more interesting. So you can interact with whales and do all kinds of neat stuff. This was the stuff I had up earlier that, that some of you guys played around with and, and we're looking at those, those videos. It's gotten a lot easier now that YouTube can host these 360 videos because you don't have to host them yourselves. They were, they were difficult a few years ago for us to get them going. 
but we're using these, this technology in a variety of ways. So for example, our nurse, nursing students are they're using this technology to, to train nursing students to be more uh, empathetic. So in this case, they have a virtual reality headset on, and you can see on the TV screen what they're looking at, they're simulating macular degeneration and, um, and memory failure. And so, so what, what the student is looking at is a big black dark spot in the middle, and that's simulating what somebody that has macular degeneration is experiencing as he's trying to have his birthday party and all this kind of stuff. So it really gives nurses an opportunity to empathize with their patients. And so we think we can use this technology for all kinds of other environmental controversies to try to show people some of the things they maybe aren't, aren't perceiving. Um, one of the things we talked about, I just threw the slide in, some of us were talking at dinner last night, but um, this is a really, uh, you can do all kinds of killer stuff. So um, this was a demo on the upper right on the Santa Monica Pier, which is in Los Angeles. People would look through this thing and, and see what sea level rise is predicted to do to their beach. On the lower, on the bottom is a, is a concept designed for a, a free app that we're, we're, the people have made but didn't work really well. We're thinking about trying to redo it. So you can, you can look, and, and, and this part right here is all, this part right here is all real-time stuff. This part here is place-based. It knows where we are, and it, it's showing where the, the sea level could be in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So that's a way to engage with the public in ways that they maybe haven't, you know, when, we show, when I show graphs and things like that and bar charts, they're like, you know, that's boring. But showing them this really gets a much more visceral response. Um, and we do a lot more broader engagement. So, so we do things like um, invite the public in for competitions. So we have a drone data race. You guys should come down and compete next year. The first year was, was a, a modeled oil spill, a mock oil spill. Last year was a mock wildfire that was created before the wildfire, though nobody believed us. Um, and so the idea is there to talk about this technology, get people engaged, and get people thinking about the value of how they can build a business around this technology uh, as well. And we have prizes from industry that people can win. Um, and so I'm hoping that, that some of these ideas, I know I went really fast, but some of these ideas might be of interest to you guys. And I would say um, as proof in the pudding of some of the, of the value of this approach of having a strong service learning focus, applied research, um, just for my students that have gone to New Orleans, uh, more, at least nine of them have moved there since because they, they're so committed to that community from our, our one little brief class. Um, mostly my students go to work in um, resource management agencies, consulting firms, et cetera, things like that. But increasingly, um, we didn't set out to do this, but a lot of them are getting hired in the tech industry, moving to San Diego or other locations. And increasingly, they're actually staying right by us and starting up their own businesses. And so that's becoming a huge source of, of uh, employment for our students. Uh, more than 90% of our students are employed doing what we train them to do within four months of their graduation. Some of them take the summer off, so I say four months. But um, I'm very, very proud of that. My, some of my fellow institutions, those numbers are more like 60% or, or lower in terms of students doing what we train them to do. Um, and that's because of, uh, well, it must be because of the great professors, clearly. But, but it's, uh, it really is a success metric. Um, Whenever our students go to grad school or whatever, we, we constantly get requests, can we have some more students? We feel they're very well pre prepared, which I think is the same exact thing with you guys. We were just talking earlier about your ODS program. I'm sure it's the same thing with that. And um, we can quantify that for just, for example, just our Louisiana efforts alone, our student labor over the last 13 years has been equivalent to more than a million dollars in matching equivalent labor that our partners use for federal matching grants and stuff. So, so it's been, um, I think a lot of, uh, independent assessment shows that this approach has been very effective. So again, that curiosity, engagement, tech, diversity, all that stuff is great. Um, these are all these things that we do with our classes. It'd be great to talk about how many of these we could do with you guys in a, in a combined uh, class or collaboration inside formal education stuff or, or outside classrooms to, to collaborate with you guys. So by all means, check out our websites, send me an email. Um, we'd love to talk with you guys and, and thanks for hosting me. And I look forward to having dinner with you guys and chatting longer. And I'm sorry I probably went on a bit, a bit too long, but thank you. <laughs> you did great. Okay.